Even with the passage of the Compromise of 1850, uh, in both the North and the South, there was still uh, many tensions. And uh, as we'll see in the, in the years that followed the Compromise, these tensions would serve to weaken both national parties, both the Whigs as well as the Democrats. The, the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854 would only serve to further widen the gulf between the North and South. Uh, and there would be violence and bloodshed in the Kansas Territory as a direct result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And this, this area known as Bleeding Kansas would just tear this, this country apart, and it foreshadowed the violence of the American Civil War. In uh, this lesson, we're going to first examine the renewed sectional conflict between North and South following, in the years following the Compromise of 1850. We're, we're going to examine the Kansas-Nebraska Act and, uh, and its impact, and we're finally we're going to look at this violent conflict surrounding the settlement of the Kansas Territory. So we're going to begin with talking about how, even with the passage of the Compromise of 1850, tensions continued to mount between North and South. Now, that fugitive slave law that was part of the Compromise, that created some problems. Because the, from, from, it had federal agents going up North and basically seizing uh, African Americans uh, in the North. And many Northerners came to sympathize more and more with the plight of the runaway slaves. So it just kind of made the issue of slavery even that more uh, apparent in the public eye. And many Northerners believed that these runaway slaves were being unjustly kidnapped and forced into a life of servitude. <clears throat> now, it, there was one incident that illustrates this opposition that occurred in Christiana, Pennsylvania. See, there, there were four runaway slaves in Pennsylvania. They're trying to escape and win their freedom. And when federal agents arrived, the local residents of Christiana, they took up arms against the federal agents. And there was a gun battle, and a federal agent was killed. Uh, so what happened is the federal government uh, brought 30 residents of this little town uh, and brought them up on charges of treason. Now, they were tried by a local jury, and the local jury was sympathetic to their fellow townspeople, and they were all found innocent. But that incident illustrates the, the, how this issue of the fugitive slaves was creating support for these slaves in the North. Now, another important event that happened in 1852 was the publication of the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin by, by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Now, Harriet Beecher Stowe, if that name should sound familiar, she was the, the daughter of Lyman Beecher, the famous preacher and abolitionist. And uh, she, what, what motivated her to write this novel was her, her moral outrage at the fugitive slave law. She was an abolitionist herself, thought that slavery was terrible. And she wrote the novel because she wanted to portray slavery as an evil and ungodly institution. She wanted to convince Christians such as herself that, that slavery was a disgrace and a sin and needed to be abolished immediately. Now, in the book itself, the hero of the book was a slave, Uncle Tom, was portrayed as a Christ-like figure, as a, someone that Christians could identify with. Now, now this book was a, a bestseller. I mean, it, it sold millions of copies in America and, and across the world. In fact, uh, it was the number one bestseller. Only, only the Bible sold more copies than Uncle Tom's Cabin in, in the 19th century. Now, what this novel did was to convince many Americans up north that slavery was immoral and that slavery was a sin. Now, in the South, it made many Southerners very, very defensive. A lot of Southerners, they were Christians too, and they, were, they, they believed that you could be a Christian and a slave owner at the same time. So, so you had a lot of Southerners feeling like they had, were on the defensive and their faith was being questioned by, by Stowe. So it only served, this novel only served to further the divide between public opinion in the North and uh, in the South. And in the South, it became very defensive of slavery as their own per, 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 peculiar institution, as they used to refer to it. Now, the election of 1852 would serve to further harm national unity, uh, because as a result of this election, the Whig Party, one of the two national parties, would basically just collapse. 
uh, and uh, the, Whig, the Democratic Party would be weakened as well. Now, in 1852, the Democrats united behind a man named Franklin Pierce of New Hampshire. And uh, he was a, a, a northerner from New England, but he had broad popular support in the South. The Whigs decided to go with a, well, a familiar strategy. They went with a war hero. Winfield Scott, old fuss and feathers, uh, hero of the Mexican War, he was brought in uh, as the candidate of the Whig Party. Now, by this time, you had more and more northern Whigs who were against slavery who objected to Winfield Scott. He, he was a slave owner, he was from Virginia, and he came out publicly in support of the fugitive slave law. So, now Whigs didn't like, some Whigs up north didn't like Scott for his fact that he was a slave owner, but a lot of people were disgusted by Scott because he campaigned to win the votes of Catholics. Um, by, by this time, millions of, of, of primarily Irish Catholic immigrants had poured into the country, and um, Scott figured that he could win their votes. But by trying to win the votes of Catholics, he alienated the Protestant base of the Whig party up north. You see, uh, uh, many Protestants up north, uh, many were, they were very concerned with this huge influx of Catholics, Irish Catholics and German Catholics, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons was that they, 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 they said that these immigrants were taking jobs away from quote unquote real Americans. You see, by this time, many Protestants believed that they were the only real Americans. They, they called themselves nativists, like they were the natives of America. And, and these Protestant uh, Americans believed that only, the only real Americans were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. And the way they saw it, these Roman Catholics were a threat. They were, they were dangerous. They were anti-democratic. They were superstitious. Uh, they, they were papists. It was, it was be widely believed among Protestants that Catholics took their orders directly from the Pope, that the Pope was the Antichrist, and that the Pope uh, told, gave his marching orders out to his Catholics. So, so uh, in 1852, when Scott began to campaign among Catholics, a lot of Whigs up north, uh, they, they just said, enough, we're leaving the Whig party. Now, in the years after the election of 1852, a lot of these Whigs who left the Whig party, they organized a party of their own. It's called the American Party. And it was basically a one-issue party. It was a party that was opposed to Roman Catholic immigration. Now, this party is known, uh, was known at the time and is known to history as the Know Nothing Party. Uh, why was that? Well, because a lot of the people who joined this party belonged to secret fraternal organizations that were opposed to immigration. Um, remember, we talked about the Freemasons. That would be an example of a secret society. Well. These new secret societies that were anti-immigrant uh, were societies like the Order of the Star-Spangled Banner. And now, when you joined a secret society, you could not publicly acknowledge that you were a member of that organization. So when anybody asked these people uh, what or if they belonged to this organization, they'd say, I know nothing. So that, that, that term, know nothing party, became associated with the American party because so many members of that party were members of these anti-immigrant secret organizations. So, so in 1852 election, the Whig party basically was collapsing and uh, the Democrats were, were able to easily dominate and win the election. And pretty much that, that election of 1852 was uh, the, the beginning of the end of the Whig party. Now, when Franklin Pierce got elected president after 1852, he, de he pursued policies that ended up de weakening the National Democratic Party, because what he did through his policies was to alienate many Northern Democrats uh, because he pursued policies that were in the best interests of Southern Democrats. You see, Pierce, he might have been a native of New England, but his whole political career had been through his, the support he enjoyed from Southern Democrats. Like, and for example, Jefferson Davis, the fire eater, was his Secretary of War during his administration. Now, a couple of things that Pierce did to alienate Northern Democrats, one of the things he did was the Gatson Purchase. Uh, the Gatson Purchase involved paying $10 million 
for territory in what is today mostly southern Arizona. Now this was $10 million for basically desert. Now the reason why the Pierce administration pursued this deal was that they wanted to build a railroad and they saw that this was the fastest way to get a railroad, this is the easiest route from Texas to California. See they wanted to build a railroad that would be, have a southern route so that more southern settlers bringing their slaves would settle in the New Mexico territory so that New Mexico would become a slave state. Uh, and then another thing that, another policy of the Pierce administration that was controversial was the so-called Ostend Manifesto. It came out in 1844 that uh, the Pierce administration was in secret negotiations with Spain. See, Spain owned and controlled Cuba, and as part of these negotiations, the United States actually threatened to go to war with Spain unless Spain immediately agreed to sell the United States, the United States Cuba for $130 million. The thinking was that, that Cuba would be a good place where you could have slavery, and this, would, this would be, could be added to the Union as a potential new slave state. But uh, when news of the manifest, the Austin Manifesto, when news of it hit the public, the public was in generally outraged. And a lot of northern Democrats were outraged because the way they saw it, this country was threatening to go to war to add a new slave state to the Union. And so uh, now when, when the news of this Austin Manifesto got out, popular support for Pierce collapsed, and uh, he never did make good his claim or his threat to go to war against Spain. So we see that by 1854, the country was in, the, the Democratic Party was having unity problems of its own. Now, now Stephen Douglas of Illinois, the senator, we've mentioned him before, he, he wanted to unite the Democratic Party, and he still felt that popular sovereignty was the way that you could unite Democrats. And so in 1854, he proposed the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Now, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was based on the principle of popular sovereignty. And under this plan, um, the residents of these territories could decide for themselves whether they wanted to enter the Union as a free state or a slave state. Now, one of the reasons why he pushed for this plan was because part of this Kansas-Nebraska Act called for the construction of a northern route for the railway. The, the railway line was going to run from Chicago, which was in Illinois, Il uh, Douglas's home state, to California. Now, so Douglas had something for his state in mind as well. Now, the way that Douglas figured this would work would be that uh, Kansas, since it was right next to Missouri, it would join the Union as a slave state. And meanwhile, the Nebraska, because the railway would run through the north, would, would enter the Union as a free state. So from uh, Douglas's perspective, everybody would win. The slave states would get a new state. The free states would get a free state. Everybody wins. Everybody's happy. So he used his political clout to get this bill into law. So it was passed as the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854. Now, contrary to what Douglas hoped, this act only made the country even more divided. Um, a lot of Northerners felt that, that this, this act was, uh, was terrible because basically it overturned the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise, remember, said that there would be all states north of that 3630 line would be free states. And they were angry that this Kansas-Nebraska Act was north of that 36 line. So from, the, from their perspective, what this act did was, ex was expanded the amount of territory that was open to slavery. And many Northerners were convinced that wealthy Southern planters were behind this act, that, that the slave power, the Slavocrats down South were, were trying to push through their agenda. Now, as a re direct result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act in 1854, concerned citizens in places like Illinois and Iowa and across the Midwest, they began to gather and, or and begin to organize themselves and they began to call themselves the Republican Party. Now, they, they took their name from the party of Thomas Jefferson. Remember, Thomas Jefferson had been a, credit, had been a critic of the Federalists, who they accused of being a bunch of aristocrats. And in the same way, these new Republicans were saying that the Slavocrats, the wealthy planters in the South, were uh, a bunch of aristocrats that were a threat to Republican principles and the Republic itself. Now, this new Republican Party, as it grew and gained steam, it, uh, 
it did have the support of abolitionists because they were opposed to the extension of slavery. But mainly, this new Republican Party attacked slavery on economic grounds, um, not on moral grounds. They, they claimed that uh, slavery only benefited the very wealthy. It only benefited the wealthy elites, the plantation owners, and didn't help the average American. And, and they believed, the, the Republican Party believed that free labor, a system of wages, uh, was, would, would allow the common man to raise himself up. You know, through hard work, you could earn wages, save your money, start a business, and the free market system would give you opportunity to, to grow and succeed. They, 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 the Republican Party was a party of equal opportunity for all and free labor. Now, the New Republican Party was not just about, they didn't want to be a one-issue party. They didn't want to be like the Free Soil Party or the Liberty Party of the past. So they, had a, they began to develop a, 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 a number of different ideas. Like one of their ideas was that there should be uh, more education for the average American. They, they wanted to see the creation of state technical college, uh, colleges across the nation uh, paid for from, from federal funds. They, uh, they wanted to see free land out west, free homesteads, so people could start new farms, new lands out west. Remember that was a vision of Thomas Jefferson to see America expand and grow as a, an agrarian nation. And they also took up the cause of protective tariffs. They, they said, we need protective tariffs to create jobs for Americans. We want to protect American workers and American jobs. So, so this new Republican Party was portraying itself as the champion of the common man, just like the party of Jefferson, just like the old Democratic Republican Party of Thomas Jefferson. Now, many Free Soil Party folks who had organized themselves in 1848, they, they flocked and they joined this new party. And at the same time, former Whigs, they joined the party. And a lot of those Wilmot Democrats, they joined the party. So this Republican Party started from nothing and it grew very, very rapidly. Now, this Republican Party, though, would be a blow to national unity because at this point in history, there were no Southern Republicans. You see, the, the Republican Party was only a party up north. And it would unite the North and create a situation where uh, North would have the tyranny of, of the majority that, that Calhoun had so much feared back in, in 1850. Now, another result of the Kansas-Nebraska Kansas Act was that it led to violence and bloodshed in the Kansas Territory. You see, um, since popular sovereignty would decide whether Kansas would be a free state or a slave state, both sides sent their settlers into Kansas. And pretty soon, you, it was like a competition between pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces. And uh, eventually, this competition would lead to violence and bloodshed. Now, now, each side wanted to bring their settlers into the territory, because that would give them the votes to make their territory, make the territory either a free state or a slave state. Now, the abolitionists, they organized the Immigrant Aid Society. Remember we talked about how societies were part of the antebellum reform? Well, the Immigrant Aid Society was organized to uh, support immigration, to get people who were anti-slavery moved to Kansas. Uh, a prominent in, the, in this Immigrant Aid Society was Henry Ward Beecher. That name should be familiar. He was Harriet Beecher Stowe's brother and uh, another child of Lyman Beecher. And in fact, uh, when he would, he would preach all over the country to get people to support settlers moving to Kansas. And uh, at one point, he said, hey, what we need, we don't need as much Bibles as we need rifles to fight for Kansas. And so uh, as a result of that particular speech, uh, people in Kansas would hold up their rifles and they'd say, hey, I have myself a Beecher Bible. So that was just a joke of the uh, jokes in the 1850s. Hey, what can you do? Now, um, now, the, the, the pro-slavery folks, they organized their, their own militia, and their own, they were armed as well. And, and they were called border ruffians by their opponents. Because a lot of times, these, these militants, these, these militiamen, came from Missouri, and they'd cross the border from, militia, from Missouri into Kansas and make raids on the, the anti-slavery forces in Kansas. Now, by 1856, Kansas was divided. Uh, it had two territorial capitals. Lecompton 
was the, cap the territorial capital of the pro-slavery settlers, and Lawrence was the capital of the anti-slavery um, residents. Now, in 1856, the pro-slavery militia launched an attack on Lawrence, Kansas, and they, they burned down the hotel, which had served as the headquarters of the Immigrant Aid Society. And they also burned down a number of anti-slavery printing presses. Now, this event became known as the Sack of Lawrence. Now, in response to this attack, there was uh, uh, an, a, another attack by an anti-slavery figure by the name of John Brown. Now, John Brown was a fiery, radical abolitionist who advocated the use of force, and he had organized his own militia that included many of his sons, and, uh, and, and in, in the course of fighting, he had lost one of his sons. So he was very angry, and after the sack of Lawrence, uh, he found a number of wh who, who, whom he thought were pro-slavery settlers. They were along the Potawatomi River in Kansas. And when he found these guys, he, he pulled five of them, and they, they cut them down. I mean, they, they dismembered them with broadswords in front of their own wife and their, their wives and children. It was called, it was, this event was called the Potawatomi Massacre. So you had the, the sack of Lawrence, and then you have the Potawatomi Massacre by John Brown and his militia. And so these, these events were uh, affecting the entire country. People were hearing about it in the newspapers. And you, not only were you having violence in Kansas, but you had violence in Washington, D.C. After the sack of Lawrence, uh, Charles Sumner, who he was an abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, he got on the Senate floor and he just went off on the entire South and the, the state of South Carolina. The speech was called the crime against Kansas. Now this was a very fiery speech and, and very uh, personal. He, he made a number of personal attacks on Senator Andrew Butler of South Carolina. Now Andrew Butler at the time was an elderly gentleman uh, and he didn't, he was a gentleman, he took no uh, action, but Butler had a nephew who was a congressman uh, from South Carolina. His name was Preston Brooks. Preston Brooks I believed that the honor of his family, the honor of the South had been attacked, the, South, the honor of South Carolina had been attacked. So what he did is he entered the Senate chamber, took a cane, and beat Sumner senseless, beat him down. And uh, of course, he was expelled from the House of Representatives for his actions, but it was the response to this event that shocked both North and the South. Uh, in the North, Preston Brooks was seen as a bully and a, as a ruffian, as a barbarian monster. But in the South, he was, he was hailed as a great hero. In fact, you, people could buy canes that looked just like the cane used by, uh, by Preston Brooks to beat up Sumner. I mean, so in the South, he was a hero. In the North, he, he was a villain. So that reflects the fact that the North and South had, were completely divided over what was going on in the country. Now, the election of 1856 only served to further weaken the unity of the country. Uh, and, uh, and also, it, it uh, created problems for the issue of Kansas. Now, in, in this particular election, uh, the North was divided. The electorate was divided. Um, the, re the Republican candidate was a man named John C. Fremont. Republicans had learned something from the Whigs. Uh, uh, Fremont was a war hero from the Mexican War. Um, the, the Whigs and the New American Party, uh, there wasn't much left of the Whig Party by this point, but the American Party nominated former President Millard Fillmore. So you had basically, uh, the, the Northerners were divided between Fremont and um, Fillmore. Now, the Democratic Party was one of the few parties left that had a national following, and they nominated a man by the name of James Buchanan, who was of Pennsylvania. And he was able to carry the entire South and enough states up north to win the election. So Buchanan won the election. The problem with Buchanan as president was that uh, he, like Pierce, was a longtime friend of Southern Democrats. And, and people, critics referred to Pierce and Buchanan as doe faces because they, they didn't have a personality of their own. They were, uh, they were portrayed as... Uh, 
as basically doing the will of Southern Democrats, as being basically supporters of slavery, uh, not having a will of their own. Um, now, just to give you an idea of what I mean by Buchanan being a long-term friend of Southerners, uh, he had served as Secretary of State under uh, President Polk. And he'd been the guy who had been behind the Ostend Manifesto in 1854. Now, what Buchanan did as president was to further, further alienate the Northern Democratic Party. So, so as a result of Buchanan's policies, more and more Democrats defected to the Republican Party that continued to grow in strength. Now, one of the things he did that angered Democrats up north was that he supported the Lecompton Constitution. See, what had happened is, that in 1857, slave state, staters in Kansas had went ahead and wrote up a constitution that would make Kansas into a slave state. Now, um, this when they had this convention, no free staters had been involved at all in drafting this Lecompton Constitution. And uh, when it went for a vote, most of the free staters didn't even participate in the election. In fact, only one of every 12 Kansas residents voted for the Lecompton Constitution. So the, the, the Lecompton Constitution made a mockery of the idea of popular sovereignty. So of course, Stephen Douglas, a Northern Democrat, came out very much against it and denounced this Lecompton Constitution as a mockery of the, pop, of the concept of popular sovereignty. And of course, Republicans in Congress, they, they opposed it as well. So what ended up happening is that Congress uh, pushed through a bill that called for another election in Kansas to, to ratify the Lecompton Constitution. And uh, when this Lecompton Constitution was put to another vote in Kansas, this time more people participated, including people opposed to slavery, and the Lecompton Constitution was uh, rejected by a 10 to 1 margin. Eventually, in 1860, when Kansas did enter the Union, Kansas would enter the Union as a free state. But by, by, by 1860, by the time Kansas entered the Union, um, the Republican Party had, had gained enough strength. It had won over a lot of members of the American Party by embracing anti-immigrant views. And uh, the stage was set for the election of 1860 and uh, the succession of the southern states. In the next lesson, we're going to examine the events that led up to that famous election of 1860 and examine why and how the southern states succeeded from the Union.